Okay, so in part two of the Renaissance, Unit 12, we're going to talk about the artist of the Italian Renaissance. We're going to talk about writers like Petrarch and Machiavelli, and then we're going to talk about the great painters and sculptors that you might know better as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, we're going to talk about all their great accomplishments and all those good things in this video. Yes, Bubba? Okay, this is Unit 12, Part 2 of the Italian Renaissance. And in this one, we're going to talk about how uh, Niccolo Machiavelli's book, The Prince, has a huge impact. We're also going to talk about how Petrarch's starting of sonnets and the idea of humanism. And then we're going to talk about the great artist of the uh, Italian Renaissance in this video. Okay, so first we're going to talk about literature during the Italian Renaissance. And we've got to start off with Petrarch. He was an Italian poet and scholar who created sonnets. And uh, his particular sonnets were written for a woman named Laura. Uh, now, one of the interesting things is, is a lot of people believe that she was imaginary. Others believe that she is someone who had died. I don't know. Wearing that hat, I'm not so sure he could have gotten a date. But hey, you know, who knows? Some people like stuff like that. Probably the more important thing is, is that he was a humanist. And this idea that every person could better themselves through studying the Greeks and Romans. And he also believed that uh, Christianity and the Renaissance ideas could exist together. Now, the second writer you need to know about is a guy named Niccolo Machiavelli. He wrote an essay called The Prince. And in it, it is sort of like an early treatise or uh, definition of what government should be and basically it supported the absolute power of a ruler and it said that he must do anything he needs to to get the outcome that he wants or needs for his people and he basically maintains that the end justifies the means that means you might have to kill you might have to lie you might have to cheat but that in the end it would be better for the people if the ruler did this now, he also advises that one should not only do good if possible, but you also may do evil when it's necessary. This is a pretty controversial idea, as you can imagine, especially for some of the churchgoers of the Italian Renaissance. As commerce evolved and modernized, so did the political landscape. Sir Thomas More, for one, was the chief administrator for Henry VIII. One of the most controversial political theorists was the Italian statesman Niccolo Machiavelli. In his book, The Prince, he extols the virtues of tyranny the rulers must use to maintain power. Since Machiavelli supports a republic, some scholars believe the prince was a satire. Others argue that Machiavelli was merely describing the political reality of the day. Machiavelli is a fascinating figure in part because his literature was essentially accidental. He was an official of the Florentine Republic. He was an important diplomat. He made important diplomatic missions for the Republic of Florence, representing them in Rome and in France, as well as elsewhere. Uh, he was, therefore, a man with real knowledge and real access to the real politics of the Renaissance in the very late 15th century and early 16th century. But he loses his job when the Florentine Republic collapses. The advice he gives is probably not terribly different from the advice that any top official political world would give to a prince or to a ruling state at this time. And it is the happenstance of Machiavelli's desperation for a job at a particular moment which causes Machiavelli to be the man that we associate with Renaissance politics rather than any of several dozen or hundred men, contemporaries of Machiavelli, who were also assisting and administering the affairs of state. Um, the Italian principalities and republics. Okay, in the arts, uh, some of the things that are important is some of the new techniques that are going to be developed. Now, medieval art 
had focused uh, and literature had focused on the church and salvation. And let's be honest, medieval art wasn't exactly the most uh, realistic looking art in the world. Characters were sort of two dimensional, uh, faces were turned to the side a lot and flat. And uh, Renaissance art is going to focus on individuals and worldly matters along with Christianity. And probably the biggest thing is, is that they sort of reinvent linear perspective. Now the Greeks uh, had used linear perspective for some time before this, but sort of refound again during the Renaissance. And remember that what linear perspective does is it gives the illusion of three dimensions. It makes it look like a flat surface has depth. And if you get really good at it with shading and whatnot, you can really give the illusion of depth. I think I'm going to walk down that hall right now. It looks so real. Florence is a city of fewer than 400,000 people. 500 years ago, it was the scene of a series of events that would change the face of Europe, the Renaissance. Renaissance literally means rebirth. It was a cultural revolution that marked the transition from the Middle Ages to the modern era. The Renaissance was triggered by a revival of interest in classical Greece and Rome. The wealthy city of Florence became the scene of dramatic changes in the fields of architecture, art, and science. One of the earliest expressions of this was the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. Completed in 1436, it took more than a century to build. In a sign of the wealth and power of Renaissance Florence, the cathedral could house 30,000 people, half of the city's population at that time. Florence is home to one of the most famous works of Renaissance art, the Statue of David by Michelangelo. The statue took Michelangelo three years to complete. At 17 feet high, David is as tall as a double-decker bus. Cut from a single block of stone, he weighs six tons. Since David was finished in 1504, the statue has suffered a troubled history. In 1527, his left arm was broken off in a riot. In 1843, a misguided cleaning attempt using hydrochloric acid stripped some of the original surface. And in 1991, a disturbed Italian painter smashed some of his toes with a hammer. Despite these setbacks, the statue remains an enduring symbol of Renaissance Florence. Nearly 10 million tourists visit the city every year. They are drawn by its art, the legacy of a cultural revolution that helped shape the modern Western world. Okay, now, who are the great artists who used these ideas of the Italian Renaissance? The first is a guy named Donatello, and he is known as the founder of modern sculpture. His most famous work was a bronze uh, casting of the uh, biblical hero David. It is considered the first life-size nude. Okay, so Donatello, again, the father or founder of modern sculpture. Now, the next great artist that I want you to know about is a painter known as Raphael. He was famous for his ideas uh, of harmony and proportion, and his most famous work is called The School of Athens, in which all of the most brilliant minds of the city-state of Athens are located in the painting. You know, Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, uh, Pythagoras, Hippocrates, they're all in this painting. Now... Uh, so, again, Raphael is the artist here. Then we get into probably the two most famous artists of the Renaissance in Italy. And that would be Leonardo da Vinci, who is in his painting here, or drawing, excuse me, the Vitruvian Man. But to say that da Vinci was just an artist wouldn't do him justice. He studied science and the human body and physics. He had working designs for a helicopter and a tank. 
The dude was truly the Renaissance man. He learned things, as many things as he could. He even broke into morgues and cut open human bodies so he could see how they worked. And, of course, his most famous work is the Mona Lisa, uh, the painting that has captured people for uh, imaginations forever. And we'll talk much more about da Vinci's works in class. Uh, this is La Pieta, I believe. Uh, the Madonna of the Rocks is what it is. And then it's, and then this is, of course, The Last Supper. And we'll talk more about that in class as well. Finally, the last artist of the Italian Renaissance is a guy known as Michelangelo. He was perhaps the greatest artist of the Renaissance. Uh, his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel uh, is just remarkable. He also did the sculpture of David, which I'll show you here in just a minute. Uh, the picture over here to the left is actually a self-portrait he did of himself. Self-portrait he did of himself. That's really redundant, wasn't it? All right, so here's some of the works of Michelangelo. This is La Pieta, the Virgin Mary holding Jesus' body after it was taken off the cross. And then the sculpture of David, the most famous work, uh, one of the most famous sculptures in the world. And then this is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the spark of life where God is touching Adam. Now to get, you get the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Yep. Okay, so what I would like for you to do is write down some important items that you learned about the Italian Renaissance right here. We'll do the Northern after we finish that video, and then you can compare and contrast the two quite a bit. All right, so what's the big ideas of this video? The Renaissance produced new ideas that were reflected in art, philosophy, and literature. Medieval art and literature focused on the church and salvation, while Renaissance art and literature focused on individuals and worldly matters along with Christianity. And then the last thing is the artistic and literary works by Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Raphael, Donatello, Niccolo Machiavelli, and Francisco Petrarch were uh, an era of unprecedented success. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video.